The following podcast is a discussion between two experts in their fields of beauty and not meant to be taken as medical advice. Be sure to consult with your doctor if you have any medical inquiries. This is Dr. David Schaefer, uh, double board certified plastic surgeon uh, by both the American Board of Plastic Surgery, also American Board of Surgery, and all areas of cosmetic surgery, a true pioneer in many areas, uh, been a national peer trainer for Botox, dermal fillers, combining non-invasive and surgical procedures to achieve natural looking results. Um, and this has resulted in him being peer nominated as a Castle Connolly top doctor. I specialized, uh, I was trained in Mayo, Completed a world class aesthetic fellowship for face, breast, and body. Um, and uh, he has been featured in the media for many things, including most recently, I think it's has to, hashtag resting bitch face injections and hashtag resting yeah. bro face. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, you, you do a lot of interesting things, and we wanted to focus on just a couple, if, you, if that's okay. Sure, that's great. Uh, so I uh, saw that, first of all, Resty Bitch Face and Resty Bro Face, uh, those have gone viral the last couple of weeks. Uh, let's explain kind of the synthesis of that, of where that came from. Yeah, I, I mean, people come in and we, we put Botox fillers and address some of their issues. But to give a name to a constellation of symptoms the patient has, I think makes it more identifiable for people. So... When you say resting bitch face or resting bro face, people immediately understand what you're talking about. And people come out of the woodwork saying, hey, I have that too. Or my mom has that, she gave it to me. Or my friend has that, my sister has that, that kind of thing. And it also kind of breaks down that barrier so the patient feels a little bit more comfortable asking about having a procedure, what can I do about it? And in terms of the media, they could grab onto that headline and then basically uh, it went from there and went viral. Amazing, amazing. And for our audience who doesn't know, that's going to be the downturned smile, a little bit of the heavy brows. Um, anything else in your RBF formula? Yeah, that's pretty, that, that, those are the main things. And the one thing that I describe to patients is we use Botox to block the action of muscles. And the FDA um, approved versions of it are for around the crow's feet between the eyebrows and the forehead. And we're all used to using Botox for those reasons. But we can use Botox as a tool in other places of the body, such as the lower face, and use the mechanism of action that we know to make a positive effect. So people with a resting bitch face or resting bro face, their depressor muscles are stronger than their elevator muscles. So if we weaken the frowning muscles, then the smiling muscles take over and you have more of a resting neutral look or a smiling look, which can be very helpful for people. Amazing, amazing. And we see that and that's like something that almost everyone will have at some point. And uh, it's that a mirror reaction we have when we see someone with an angry face, we tend to mirror that. We see someone with a smiling exactly. face, that baby, usually we're smiling at them when they smile back. Um, definitely cool. Yeah. Uh, it, and it's, it's something too, it's, it's an addition to other things people might have. So, um, you know, when people come in, they have a wrinkle here, a wrinkle there, but now, you know, being able to address the lower face as well, I, I think it's very helpful for people. And we're going to work our way a little bit lower in the body to something you're, you're really famous for as well. Yeah. Um, the swag procedure for male enhancement. So yeah. uh, where did that originate? When did you start that? And let's talk about some of that, those foundations of that. Sure. So I've been doing dermophilia since I started practice. And when I started practice is the same year the stock market crashed. So even though I'm a board certified plastic surgeon, I really got into the dermophilia, Botox, other treatments that are low price point, quicker recovery that more patients could, could have during that time. And so I built up a huge injection practice and then also a surgical practice, about 50-50 right now. And the techniques you use for fillers, just like we just talked about Botox, you can use the same techniques in other parts of the body. And so one day when I was injecting a woman's face, the boyfriend who was sitting in the room jokingly said, hey, can I have that stuff in my penis? And uh, a, a, a light went off and I, you know, I thought, you know, why not? It's part of the body. There's the different skin layers. Well, uh, we can use a cannula, which we use now in the face that, that makes it very safe. And so I, I told him, if you want to be the guinea pig, we'll try it on you and see how it works. And that kind of, it all kind of went from there. Perfect. 
Um, and it's interesting that uh, filler in that area. So when someone comes in, first of all, the first barrier to get them in, do they usually mm -hmm. come in and say, um, you know, I'm interested in this or is there a, a significant other that's calling them in or what, what, what's your ratio of patients coming in for, for, for male enhancement? Yeah, they come in for all different reasons. And it's not like most other procedures that we do in an office. If you do Botox on somebody, then their friend sees them, their family member sees them, they recommend it to somebody else. This isn't something that a guy does and then goes and tells everybody at the gym or at home that he did it. So, you know, each person has come in because they've researched it on the internet, they've had concerns for a while about it. So, so most people are kind of the awkwardness about their penis, their size, those kind of things. Sometimes you do get the wife brings the husband in. We had, I get a lot of out of town patients and somebody flew in from out of the country with their husband. He thought they were coming to my office for her. And then in the <laughs> office, she announced, she announced to him why they were at the office. So how did uh, that go? Uh, yeah, he, he was agreeable to it. <laughs> so so maybe he had thought about it in the past. But uh, you know, people come in for for all different reasons, whether it's for themselves, for their partner. But what you know, one discussion with patients is to make sure that they want to do it, that they're not being forced to do it. You know, and you, we talk about that with patients for any procedure. You, you want to do it for your own reasons and not feel pressured into to doing anything. Amazing. And what what filler did you start off with? And then what fillers have you evolved into? Yeah, so, it, you know, I, I use a lot of the Juvederm family of products and I wanted a product that was thick, that would last a long time. And so I started doing it with Voluma and that's the one I've stuck with. Patients like that it has a two year duration, um, you know, low complication. It's a hyaluronic acid, so we're able to melt it. So if there's any issue with symmetry or any other issues, you can melt it. There's other products available on the market that are either semi-permanent or permanent. And I try to stay away from those because I always say, if, if you have a, a meltable product, you can, you can solve anything. If you put a permanent product in, you can get a permanent problem. And you know, safety is uh, first and foremost uh, what I'm looking for for patients. Perfect. Um, and speaking of safety, um, so what's, if someone's coming into your office and they're asking, Hey, guess what? I'm interested in this procedure, but I'm kind of nervous to have something injected down there. Um, how does that conversation go? And what's kind of the, kind of the safety record for this? Cause this is, yeah, it, it's, a, it's an off label use for the product. So I tell them about that. I discuss the safety studies that have been done for the FDA on the face, longevity, complication rates, those kind of things. It's the same set of complications that you could have with any treatment or filler. So the most common are swelling, bruising, very, very low likelihood of nodule formation, th th those kind of things. So you have the discussion. I also go through with every patient. I have a chart of the anatomy. We look at the different skin layers, where we're putting it, how the nerve block works, all those kind of things so that they're completely informed before they have the procedure. And I discuss with, I discuss with them Amazing. about 20% of people will come back within a month or two because they love it and they just want more. And it's a similar effect that you see if you do, let's say somebody's lips and then they get positive feedback, they're happy about it, they come back, they want to put a little bit more in their lips or their cheeks, the same thing. But part of my job is to say no. So if we've done enough, I, I, you know, I have to be that kind of person to say, you know, we've done enough, if we do more, you know, the, the risk benefit ratio is not there. And as far as uh, amount of volume, it's it's probably a misconception because someone might think that, hey, guess what? I put one syringe in someone's yeah. lips and, you know, a syringe of Voluma in someone's lips might be a big change mm -hmm. for someone. In in the penis, you might need maybe five is conservative. Yeah, right? You might yeah. need 10, 15 it, before they're going to see that visual impact that they're, they're going to want and maybe um, their partner. Yeah, definitely. Want. So what, what are yeah, the and, and, and guys coming off shapes and sizes, it's like breasts are all shapes and sizes. We put different size breast implants. Guys start out at different sizes. And so how much effect you're going to get for a certain number of syringes depends on the ratio of the size you're starting with and how much you're putting in. But yeah, five syringes is nothing. You need to put at least 10 syringes in, sometimes up to 20 at a time. And I have people with up to 60, 70 syringes in there. So it's, um, you know, it's a significant amount of syringes but when you think about it, each five syringes is one tablespoon. So it's a lot of packaging and a lot of opening syringes, but the actual amount in there isn't as significant as you would think. The problem is the cost. So it's not a cheap procedure because uh, as a doctor, the cost for us for this product is a premium product is a premium cost. So 
it, you know, it's not something that that's just a couple thousand dollars. It's a, um, it, you know, more involved procedure for patients. But I would think that dollar for dollar for many men who are thinking about this, I mean, how many times can you do something, have this done and not have to worry about it? I mean, to me, that seems like an amazing, I mean, that's the whole point of plastics, right? You do something so you don't have to think about it and it becomes your way. Exactly. Right. And, you know, the number of emails I get from guys and messages from them, how it changed their life, they feel better, their sex life is better, they feel more confident at the gym, whatever the reason is why they, why they want to do it, it, it it's fantastic. Um, so talking about this, um, kind of if, talking about how it's going to feel for both the male and, um, mm -hmm. and again, their partner. So um, what would what does it feel like in real life, someone who's doing this? Is this going to feel um, similar to like a normal penis? Is it going to feel a little bit different texture wise? Um, dimension yeah, wise? The, the way I describe it, it's kind of like you gained weight. So the, uh, the penis becomes obese. So it's a little kind of full. The, the skin is thicker, um, especially in the flaccid state. And then in the erectile state, the erection happens like normal and the skin grows with it. The filler grows with it. So um, it's kind of, if you imagine, just that it's a thicker layer around the erection. I, I ask every patient, you know, how was sex? Did it work out well? Did your partner like it? And, you know, the vast majority of people say, it was fantastic. My erection is still as hard as it was. It's now just thicker. My partner noticed the difference right away. So it, it's not something where they're coming back and saying it's all gushy. It doesn't. It doesn't form. You know those kind of things. Those concerns. Any issues with them wearing condoms? Because it seems like you know if you're if you're especially if we're going towards and this is kind of like you know mm -hmm. normal breasts will. Over time, there's a, there's like a normal breast, which you, you do breast, I don't yeah. do breast, I'm, I'm a face guy, but um, for penises, when we're going not just regular size, I think we're probably going yeah. maybe even like, maybe super size, which which is what mm -hmm. guys probably want. Um, how about condoms? Do condoms fit? No, it, condoms? and actually they'll come back and they'll, they'll say even the Magnum condom doesn't fit. And it, there's actually, and I didn't even know this until I started doing this procedure, there's actually some companies uh, especially in Europe and the UK that make custom sized condoms. And there's actually, we have a link to it on our, on our website. You download a PDF and there's special measurements you need to take. And then, uh, I think there's about 80 different, uh, sizes that they have for length and width and, and finding one that is comfortable for them. They probably say we have yeah, another Dr. Yeah, Schaefer patient because they, they, they have another I, giant I think I'm going to increase their business, uh, many fold, I'm, I'm sure. So. <laughs> Yeah. There you go. Uh, well, that's amazing. Um, and so just to get a little bit technical mm -hmm. with this. So when you're putting it in, you're using Correct. a cannula and cannula versus needle. Um, the, the reason for cannula is probably, is it vascular? It also smooth texture? Yeah, What's your yeah definitely. So all dermophilates started out and we just injected them with needles. And the advantage is it goes in very easily. You just poke the needle through and, and put the product. The, the disadvantage with the needle is the length of it to start with, and then also a sharp on the end. So you're putting it through the skin and you can cause bruising. You, you, it could go into a different layer that you weren't intending it to go into. But with a cannula, it's a long blunt needle for people who haven't seen them before. And we use a little introducer which uh, pokes through the skin and then we just slide the cannula right in. And once you're in the right layer, it's very easy to slide the cannula around and circumferentially go around the penis or wherever you're injecting the face and um, slide the slide the product in. So it, it gives you a degree of safety, but it also, it, there's different lengths of the cannula. So you, you can reach areas that you may not be able to reach with the needle as well. And technically speaking, where do you want that layer to be? Do you want to be just below the skin or do you want to be just that little bit layer deeper? Where do you just like a, a little bit deeper than right below the skin. And so when you're putting a cannula in, you don't, you don't want to see the actual cannula through the skin. And, and for people who do a lot of injecting, when you're doing, let's say, a superficial line on the lips or a superficial line on the nasolabial fold, you almost want to see the needle a little bit through the skin. But when you're doing it in the penis, you're going a little bit deeper and, and it, it's actually pretty amazing. You, it, the cannula just slides right into that layer and it's a nice open uh, layer where, where you can put the cannula. There are some issues. And for instance, if a guy is circumcised versus not circumcised. So 
if you're circumcised, it gives you a nice end point of where the filler is going to go. But also that skin is scarred down, so it doesn't expand as much right, right uh, between the glands, the end of the penis, and the shaft of the penis. So sometimes you can get a little gap where it doesn't expand as much because the filler can't go in there. Sometimes secondarily at their next visit, we can go in there and try to break those adhesions up a little bit to get that area to expand. And then on the other side, you have guys that aren't circumcised, and then you really need to make sure you're getting the filler into the crack layer and not putting it into the foreskin and making a constriction of the foreskin with the filler. Do you have any issues with trying to, with uncircumcised men trying to put the foreskin back on them, or is that just sort of an experience thing saying, hey, guess what, I've done so many Yeah, no, no it, uh, it, it seems to work well. If you get if you get too much filler, though, in the actual foreskin, though, it can make it tighter and you can't get it around the, the head. So you, you do have to be careful about that. I also put filler in the head. It's not as effective as in the shaft. The tissue is different. But you can enhance the crown around the around the glands, and then also a little bit into the glands itself. But uh, again, um, you want to make sure there's a good ratio. You don't want to have a small head and a large shaft. You, you get this pigs in a blanket kind of look, and so you really want to make sure that you maintain those proportions. Do you go circumferentially around, or you go just the seventy-five percent yeah. on the top area? Yeah, which, definitely. Which... So I, I go about two hundred and seventy degrees around. So. Um, and then you, you don't want to put too much on the anterior surface because it makes it look almost like an elephant trunk. So you really, you're putting the majority of it on the lateral side. Amazing. Amazing. Um, so, uh, I mean, this is, I think, I mean, you, you've been doing this for, yes. for quite a while. Do you think, um, what do you think is the barrier to having more men doing this? Because it sounds like the downsides, again, I, I don't want to put, but it sounds like the downsides are pretty limited based on studies, based on some of the studies done yeah. throughout Asia um, and using fillers, which is some of the safest things you can yeah. put in your body. Uh, so it sounds like the downsides are limited. Um, what do you think is this barrier to ultimately get more, this become the breast implants for men? You know, for men yeah, I, so I mean, speak. there's a couple of barriers. One of them is cost, but um, that's determined. You know, we put our pricing right on the website so you know before you come in. But, you know, and, and men aren't as accustomed to going to the past surgery office. Women, more a higher percentage come in for their Botox, their fillers, their breast implants, liposuction. Year over year, men, more men are coming in. So that barrier is going away. And again, like I mentioned earlier, it's not a procedure that you're telling your friends about. It's very, it's very rare to get a patient <laughs> come in because they said their friend, uh, they saw their friend, they recommended them to come in, which, which you do see with other procedures in, in other populations. But uh, I think men spend, a, especially men who are concerned, they spend a lot of time Googling on the internet at night and looking for different things. And I found that the men that come in, they, they've researched it really well. And, and I, I think they're very serious and uh, methodical about how they're thinking about it. And they've looked at the risks and benefits. They've looked at permanent failure. So they come in very informed and have very good questions for me. And usually if a person gets to the point they're already in the office and made a um, consultation, they're ready to have the procedure because they've, they've kind of contemplated it, researched all the risks and benefits ahead of time. It's not something where you come in, you do a consultation, and then they don't uh, book it. So usually, We'll book the consultation and the procedure all, all at the same time. Um, is it painful for men? So if someone's coming into your office and says, I want to get this done, I want to have 20 syringes, I know I want to do this, um, what can I do mm -hmm. afterwards? Um, is this going to be a painful day for me? And what yeah, I and, and I tell them every single guy when they get up off the table when we're done, says that wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely a sensitive area, a sensitive topic for, for guys. But we, we have our protocol that we, we put some numbing cream first, then we use a tiny little Botox needle just to do a nerve block, and then go ahead and do the, um, do the product. And the product has numbing medication in it as well. So it, it's really not as bad as you can think. Most guys sit there playing on their phone, not even paying attention while we do it. And then uh, they're like, oh, you're done already. And then, uh, and then we're done. So... It is, it is a weird sensation they describe having it numb because you, you have this kind of constant sensation of, of your penis. And if it's not, if all of a sudden it's numb, it's kind of a weird sensation for them, but, but definitely not a painful experience. 
when can they work out and when can they resume? Yeah, I, you know, I tell people to wait about a week for sexual activity. Working out, I mean, gym-wise, they could go over the same day or the next day. There's no restriction for that. I do have the patient massage the area. And the example I give is the fillers have a little cohesive property to them and they kind of want to stay together. And the example is when you make pizza. Anybody who's made pizza dough and you kind of press it on the table and you have to keep pushing it, it keeps wanting to come back towards the center. So while the filler is settling in, you really want to massage it to keep spreading it out, smoothing it out while it while it's settling in. So I, I do have them work on that a lot. The other issue is, uh, you know, the difference between a shower and a grower. The best candidate is somebody who's a shower because the penis is pretty much out and you're just filling the, the girth of it. If somebody's a grower, then there's a dynamic issue after the injection. So you put the injections in, and then if it shrinks down and turtles in a little bit, then the, the skin and the filler telescopes on itself a little bit and can cause some contour issues. So somebody like that, you might do a little bit of filler, have them come back a couple of weeks later, do a little bit more. As the weight of the filler helps the penis hang out a little bit farther, you can get a, a nice effect for them as well. Amazing. Um... Other thing in maintenance. So someone says they come in for 20 syringes. Uh, they do Melima. Um, when will they come back again typically in your office? And then how many syringes? Will they go back and get 20 again? Or will they do less as they maintain? Yeah, them? definitely. We Usually we see patients one or two times within the, the first month or two. And, you know, just adding more volume or tweaking the contour, those kind of things. And then even though the product lasts two years, that doesn't mean you don't have to come back for two years. And the example I give is when you fill your gas tank with gas, you drive maybe 150 miles and now you have half a tank. So you put half as much gas as you put the first time and it gets you, it gets you to where you're going. So the first time we're kind of filling up the tank and then every year you're kind of topping off the tank with about half as many syringes as you had the first time. And that makes sense. And I think fillers last longer than I think all of us probably probably know. And I think, for example, someone with lips, maybe it, we think it lasts six months, but there's some patients I have two years out, yeah. three years out where they haven't they haven't needed filler. So I think it's in some patients, in some areas, it just definitely. Lasts yeah. And, and some patients, oh, oh, wow. some patients, uh, you, you know, get a very nice um, longevity of it, and other people just have to come more often. I think it's just the natural metabolism in our body. You know, the enzyme we use to melt at the hyaluronic age is naturally in the body as well, and people may have different concentrations of it, different reactions with the body. All this kind of things can affect the longevity of the filler. Amazing, amazing stuff. And I think this um, this is groundbreaking in the year 2019. <laughs> I, I bet you in... One, maybe even one year, two years, three years, but it won't be groundbreaking. But what you've done for the last year is, you know, kind of A, promoting this procedure and B, mm -hmm. kind of being one of the forerunners is both um, super brave, uh, but also a kind of a true testament to your talent. So, um, oh. and I think that there's probably lots of men actually and their partners who are, who are thankful for what you do. Um, yeah. And you're super busy. So thanks for being on here. And uh, okay. Amazing to talk to you. Great. Well, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to talking to you again. All right. Thanks so much. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care.